Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 627. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 27, 2020. All right, people, you're going to want to know where I am. I'm in the same state that George is in. No, not metaphorically. I'm in Florida. And as being in Florida, I've discovered something I had forgotten since I've been here last year when I uh, stopped in for a week-long visit. As I hop out of the RV, and Jill and I just took our long trip down from Georgia. We're just, oh, let's just take a break here and get in the campground. And the second I step out of the RV, whoop! I get the foggy glasses that you know the type we put the mask on and you breathe your glasses go foggy that happens here in natural air in Florida and it's a it's a humid place uh, every time I visit I'm sure they have dry season right George tell me they have dry season here May May May's dry season coming back and so uh, beautiful 80 degree day uh, probably 4,000 percent humidity that that's okay uh, and I have a nice comfortable breeze as I record outside here with George. What have you been up to, George? Well, Kevin, you know, there are only four more days left for the hurricane season. So uh-huh. this is... Uh, dodged a bullet. <laughs> yeah, you've dodged a bullet. Uh, there's one right now in uh, Katsumel in, uh, in uh, Mexico. But uh, hmm. uh, we've, uh, we've had our second week of uh, in-person services. And... Oh, I was hoping that, boom, everybody else would come back who didn't come the first week. No. Uh, It's gradual. We moved one of the services outdoors, and that saw people come, and people told me they came specifically because it was outdoors in our memory garden, memorial garden. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is going to be a long haul uh, to return the church to state of normalcy. And we've been in touch with people. It's not like we don't know where they are. I know where they are, and they're at home. Uh, <laughs> Watching the feed. <laughs> they're not going elsewhere, and they're not not going. They're just not ready to return to in-person worship in our community. Yeah, in people, the numbers that I was hoping for. Sure. And people think it's, you know, hey, we're drawing back into church. It's getting more and more comfortable. I'm watching my church service live on Facebook at, at 10 a.m., and the music team is gone because one of them had been exposed or maybe had been exposed to somebody else who had uh, COVID the day before two days earlier and they said we're not going to have uh, music we're not going to we're going to sing a cappella, which worked fine uh, there's we we are not secure enough to return to full-time worship uh, at the the way we want to I think that's the the effect COVID is still having on us um, before we get too far guys I need you to like the episode. I want you to share the episode. George, we got the best commenters out there. Very kind. You got, okay, uh, last week some of you were kind of critical of Gavin. Cut that out. That's not how, what we do on Anglican Unscripted. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting to see the vastness of our audience. We have the obviously the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Mormons, the Anglicans, the Roman Catholics. Uh, everybody watches us, George. In the Orthodox. Did I forget the Orthodox? As well as 815 and 815. (laughs) Yes. Kevin's on camera again. Justin, Justin, you need to see. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a problem. Um, But we did. I did. I did have some uh wonderful news for me personally this week. In the Episcopal Church, your salary as a rector is based on your attendance. Uh, at plus longevity. So the older I get, the more I get paid, even if I get worse and worse. Mm-hmm. But there, there's, we have these grids, it's like the army, uh, in attendance and salary grade and all this and that. And basically it's a combination of your attendance as based on your average Sunday attendance and your time in office. So for me, it's 25, 20, however many years it's been. Sure, it's been a long plus, time, but... but... But then I go across to see how many people I have. Well, the National Church just issued the guidelines how to record average Sunday attendance for 2020. Now, this is an Episcopal inside baseball, but I think it'll be followed by most other denominations. The Episcopal Church is going to say, okay, your average Sunday attendance for 2020, the number that you plug into this box, is going to be from January 1st to March 1st. 
then there's going to be an asterisk, and then you're going to report your hybrid attendance of in-person and online from March 2nd through year's end. Now, for me, my Why, season... Yeah, you got snowbirds. <laughs> I got snowbirds. And so I'm going to look like the most fantastic, charismatic, dynamic, successful priest, because what I so historically... We've got, you know, we, we can sometimes get over 300 in February, March, April, and then in August, we got 125, 100, 100 because of vacations and snowbirds. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm going to be able to turn in figures this year. So my salary, if you see me driving a new Mercedes <laughs> next year, <laughs> yeah. because get I get the jackpot. And <laughs> so the, the, now, I'm, I'm being silly, of course, but you have to figure out some system. But mm -hmm. the National Episcopal Church, I think, is going to fool everybody, Kevin, and next year show a dramatic rise in Sunday attendance. I we think, turned uh, the corner. <laughs> it was getting rid of Bishop Love that brought people back into the church. I think that's what we're going to see from 815. Yeah, we're going to see a lot from 815. I mean, just piggybacking the great... Uh, Curry sermon back at the, the marriage of Harry and uh, what's her uh, what's her face Megan Megan Mark Megan yes uh, I've forgotten I don't pay attention to that type of stuff uh, that love that love 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 sermon uh, is now followed up with a, a kicking a bishop out because he was Orthodox and uh, I as far as I'm concerned Bishop Love should just turn off the lights shut the door and uh uh, let the eight fifteen rot. Yeah, you know, well, I think it doesn't he's, matter, Kevin, because the numbers don't count anymore. This <laughs> yeah, that's right. The numbers don't count. <laughs> Just it's crazy. So, uh, quick follow up in case you guys don't know, uh, Bishop Love of Albany had uh, during the uh, Dyson retreat, Dyson convention, sorry, convention. Uh, announced his retirement effective in February, and it says it's just not worth it. You know, the Episcopal Church is going to get what the Episcopal Church wants. And now the Episcopal Church has has wrought what it, it sowed and has very few conservative, certainly no Orthodox bishops left. Well, the technical details. Mm -hmm. Bishop Love reached an agreement with uh, the presiding bishop for discipline. Bishop Love declined to uh, appeal his earlier sentence, believing it was not worth the, the expense and the time of the paperwork mm -hmm. and he submitted himself to discipline and it was agreed that he would retire on the 14th anniversary of his consecration February 1st mm -hmm. but he would take sabbatical for the month of January and bishops love's order forbidding gay marriages in the diocese, in the diocese of Albany would remain in effect until February 1st but the consequences for performing gay marriages which are that if you do that you don't get in trouble that will remain in effect until february 1st but the kevin has mentioned an episcopal news service article which basically said it doesn't matter <laughs> if i'm reading this episcopal news service uh article correctly uh they're now wallowing in their sorrow you know bishop love has left and we're still not going to have same-sex marriage in albany this is horrible you know why can't why can't people just agree with us and we just all get along? Why can't Curry's love be the love of our nation? You know, in, in some ways, in some ways, it's I don't want to say funny because for those involved, it's tragic. It's horrible. Yeah. But the Episcopal News Service did an interview uh, and they got extensive quotes from Bishop Love's enemies in the diocese, and then they got very restrained uh, yes no answers from his allies. And they interviewed one priest who is non-parochial, who is a full-time attorney for the state government in New York. Uh, but during the summer, he is a summer chaplain at one of these Catskill uh, resorts. And his little summer chaplaincy has been gung-ho for gay marriage. Uh, and they're just, they were going to do it anyway, and they were going to defy Bishop Love. Well, nobody's wanted to get married there. So. <laughs> So here they've got a situation where they want people, they just want gay marriage, but nobody's taking them up on the offer. 
it reminds me of what happened in the Diocese of Montreal when the Diocese of Montreal introduced gay marriage. There were three or four gay marriages, all involving clergy marrying other clergy. Yeah, that's basically. And then no lay people <laughs> wouldn't yeah. bother because the the demand for gay marriage within the Episcopal Church was limited to a very small subset of people. Now, the principle of gay marriage was embraced by more people than the actual practice of gay marriage. So what's basically going to turn out is that they're going to have gay marriage in Albany just as they're going to have it everywhere if so, if anybody wants it. Well, the three or four people who want it, that'll be that. that and that's it. It's over. I mean, and we saw the same thing in an article. I think Jeff Walton or somebody put this out. The Episcopal Church's uh, marriages are down two-thirds. Yeah, two-thirds. Yeah. And that, um, seriously, the and if you compare it back to the, 40, uh, the 50s and 60s, it's mm -hmm. just disappeared. I think there were only 13,000 marriages in the Episcopal Church last year, down from like, was I think it was 30. I, I may be overstating that, but... Yeah, it's a but the there's a societal well people are getting uh kevin how old were you when you married jill 22 uh 21 let's do this here i got married in 1989 i was 23 i had bought my first house when i was 25 i had my first child at 28 um we did things a lot younger then yeah i got uh, married when i was 21 mm -hmm. and you know my, I, we each have children my children are just turning 25. Mm -hmm. They're not married. I'm still paying their car insurance <laughs> <laughs> and other bills. Uh, Kevin has three children, one of whom is married. Yeah, um, I got the liberal one married off. It's, she, yeah, I remember the conversation. She came from with, college, college the sophomore year. I don't believe in marriage. Oh, no, this one's never going to end. She's married. Well, she sold the tax benefits. That's I guess, right. Yes, but, they, <laughs> but people are getting married later societally. Uh -huh. I mean, my children aren't living with anybody uh, or anything like that. It's not that they've rejected marriage, uh -huh. but you and I were probably that last generation who, when we left home, we left home. Yeah, uh, we were I, the I boomers. Yeah, at I, the end of the boomers. I think the last time my parents prayed for anything was dinner at my college graduation. Okay. Uh, I was on. I don't mean to be churlish or anything but it was understood and i understood it just as well as they did that i was on my own and i was setting off in life if i had a crisis i could always call my dad or mom for help but i was on my own that i saw some statistic that some unconscionable number of young people under the age of 30 are still living with their parents it's 35 and it is unconscionable it's a whole different age like you said i remember leaving for college and I had never moved back. I, I, I funded college on my own. Mom and dad didn't have the money at the time uh, to pay for college. And it, it, of course, I dropped out of college. That's a different story. Um, it, but, we, but we were different mindsets. You, you tie that yeah. into the absence of people of the marrying age in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. And you have this fiasco of... Uh, no marriages yeah that's no. I don't, society doesn't respect marriage like it used to i mean i'm i've well i've got a marriage plan of uh, two 19 year olds <laughs> yeah, that's right he's a he's a corporal in the army on mm -hmm. uh, active duty at the dmz in korea and when they get home in he gets home in june they're going to get married uh but most of the other marriages i do are second marriages or people in their 70s or 80s because mm -hmm. That's the culture and cut the community where I live, but young people aren't marrying. And I don't think same sex couples have the same. Uh, the Episcopal Church has, has bought into a fantasy that people are just waiting for them to do the right thing. I remember Steve Charlton, who was the, at the time the Assistant Bishop of California during the Gene Robinson debate, said, once we con consecrate Gene Robinson as bishop, our numbers are going to go through the roof because people be, want to be part of a church that is modern and alive and doing what people think we should be doing. Well, after 2003, that's when the bottom fell out. Well, after America you know, endorsed at the Supreme Court level same-sex unions, 
uh, and same-sex marriages, it was, you know, we have redefined marriage that doesn't mean anything anymore. If anybody can get married, what's the point? And that's what we've seen. Uh, we have not seen a race from same-sex couples to get married. Uh, yes, uh, what's the statistic? 3% of uh, the population uh, suffers from same-sex attraction. Of the, of the 3%, 2%, of the 3%, 2% have gone off and uh, gotten married. That's an amazingly low statistic. <sighs> that. Well, here's the, it's, Kevin, Kevin, you, you had a, co I'm stealing all your best that's lines, Kevin. So that's what the pre-show is for, okay? <laughs> this, 2020 is a very strange year. I, uh, we've uh. been following the comments about the Bishop Love Affair, and within the Anglican, there are two Anglican responses. There's the sort of the Anglican official, to, Diocese of Don Dramour, which has been uh, Albany's partner diocese, and the bishops there have been very close to Bishop Love, put out a statement of prayer and regret. Are they going to do anything? No. Hmm. Prayer and regret. GAFCON Secretariat, which I don't know who that is. Uh, there's no name attached to it. It's not yeah. Ben Quashi. It, was, it it's wasn't the same. primates. Yeah. Uh, has basically put out a, a tut tut prayer and mm -hmm. regret. Compare this to the Akinola days where, you know, we're going to be coming and uh, uh, with torches and our veins bulging in our necks and you better beware. Uh, we don't see that. But then in the commentaries, people are noting, and especially in the Catholic traditional commentariat, that this week has shown that the Bishop of Albany is more Catholic than Pope Francis. Because the week that Pope Francis tosses overboard Catholic doctrine on family and, human, and the body and human sexuality and and just goes against everything his predecessors, especially uh, Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul II have said, we've got an Anglican bishop who is basically taking the bullet and standing up for traditional Orthodox Catholic teaching. Well, I mean, Pope Francis is exactly what we're talking about, that redefinition. He has accepted the redefinition that same-sex people can be families. That if you are a same-sex couple and you get married you or have a civil union, you are that family. And that's what uh, you know. all these liberals have been fighting for. And but you got it. Let's see what happens to your church now. You, know, you, you got what you wanted. It, and the... The, the press, the, the church press, is filled from one end of the world to the other with Catholic bishops trying to interpret and explain what Francis is saying. Sure. <coughs> and they're having a really hard time of it. There are some, like James Martin, the American Jesuit, who, uh, who is one of the most notable, at least in social media, activists for full inclusion of gays and lesbians in the church, has just said, isn't this wonderful? And then you have Franklin Graham going on social media saying Pope Francis is normalizing homosexual behavior. He is acting in an unchristian manner. Now, Franklin Graham, for those in po who those of a, of a different political persuasion, they may dislike him to begin with, but Franklin Graham has been one of these people who's worked very hard to bring evangelicals and Roman Catholics at least together on moral and social issues like same-sex marriage, like abortion, like uh, so on, all those uh, issues where there's a commonality of purpose. And Franklin Graham is torn into the Pope. And you have Cardinal Burke, uh, who's, uh, we posted his statement basically saying, well, this may be Francis's opinion, but hey, it doesn't matter. And then we see attack, people attack Cardinal Burke from the, within the Catholic world for being, basically, their response to Cardinal Burke is personal uh, invective against him. Uh, they, they say all sorts of bad names about him and that he's just frustrated and closeted and all this and that. Um, man, it really is bad for a church whose, if you will, main marketing theme is that we're a Catholic church, universal church. Uh, right, right now, its leader is saying, well, you can have individual non-Catholic uh, understandings, 
and still be a Catholic. It's, yeah. it's, no. It just is not computing. When I wake up and think about how bad the Episcopal Church is, I'm quickly reminded that, well, the Roman Catholics are, uh, at times, equally as bad. Uh, or headed that way, anyway, for sure. They're, the trajectory of the Roman Catholic Church uh, does not look good because the Pope Francis, who has all these weird personal opinions, is now appointing cardinals left and right. He's he's filling the, the rackets up. Uh, he's stacking his court uh, for his his journey and agenda. So, yeah, and the American hierarchy in the Catholic Church is not covering itself with glory. Uh, you know, especially we still have the McCarrick School still in charge. He may be gone, but his allies are running the show. Yeah. And they're pushing, pushing this agenda. Um, and then you have the, oh, it's unkind, but the second tier bishops are saying, well, you can't be a Catholic and vote for Joe Biden. You can't, the Pope is not Catholic anymore. And these guys are getting hammered from the top for making waves. So it's, if I were, if I were a traditionally minded Roman Catholic, I would be really discouraged right now to see where things are headed because you have the example of the Episcopal Church's fall from grace to, in front of you to see, and every single step the Catholic Church is taking has been, is being, what's taken by the Episcopal Church in its uh, collapse. Yeah, easily. Uh, quick update uh, for those, and here, this is how it works. Last night, uh, there was a new appointment of a Supreme Court justice. Uh, the, the court is now conservative, six to three. Uh, first time, that <laughs> certainly in my lifetime, uh, that this has happened. If you have believed everything you read in the press, you would have woken up today and there would be no abortion in this land. It would have been against the law. And that's not how this works. Um, just the the frothiness now in politics, George. It's just, I you know I read the Douglas Lincoln debates. I you know it was not good back then, but th I I've never seen more polarization, and I think obviously social media is to blame. Uh, the liberals have taken over the the public education, so we have all these little social justice warriors walking around thinking they know everything. Um, this is just not a great time for society. Yes, it's redeemable, please, but it's just not a great time uh, for society. And now we're coming up in a, a mere week on the election, Trump versus Biden. Uh, well, now, hold I, on. You always mention, Kevin, when you drive through the countryside here, it's all Trump. Florida is going Trump. I'm, I'm telling you this, and I went for my little itty bitty bike ride yesterday, out here on Gray's Airport Road, and it's kind of horse meadows and farms and stuff like that. There are no Trump banners, George. There's Trump flags, Trump this, Trump that. People have hand painted signs on their fences, hand painted on the side of the garage, Trump Trump twenty twenty twenty. Yes. The farmers in Florida are going Trump, 100%. But the cities are full of liberals. Well, they actually are transplants. Transplants. And, uh, they're right. snowbirds. <laughs> so they still vote in Connecticut. Uh, oh, I hope so. Oh. Well, that's one of the things in Florida. People, you know, these people move here from uh, California, New York, Connecticut, Illinois. And because there are no taxes here, there's no income tax in Florida, uh, the in, the inheritance tax, the bankruptcy laws are all very uh, loose compared to those of up northern states. We don't say this, we say, we, we say consumer friendly. Consumer friendly, right. and the cost of living is much lower. Yeah. And then these people move down here, and they move down here for the fiscal advantages, but then they want to recreate <laughs> the political what nightmare they yes. that they... Uh, uh, left. Now, you have to remember, Kevin, I am in that uh, farmland. I'm not in the city. <laughs> so my vision is skewed. Sure. But I will, I'm fairly confident that Donald Trump will carry Florida. Whether he carries the country, I don't know. 
but the enthusiasm uh, we've had uh, we've had Trump rallies around here and we had Donald Trump go to a, come to Alcala which is the big city near us yeah. and I had uh, the parishioners wait eight ten hours in lines and to be able to go see him at the airport at, on the tarmac of the Ocala airport um, I don't see that level of enthusiasm among the Biden supporters here it, they're more like well we were Democrats in New York and so we're still Democrats out of loyalty but we're for the Democrats we're not really for Joe Biden so I th well, this is am armchair politicking I, I well, no, have but no knowledge. We don't, but we, we kind of mentioned it when it was Hillary Trump, and we're coming up in the polls. The polls showed that Hillary was going to win, not in a landslide, but boy, she was going to pick up Madison, Minnesota, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, and the great state of Florida. And in the end, she missed some key states, not because there was more enthusiasm for Trump, but because the pollsters did not understand what, what's called the silent Trump vote. The, the numbers that get me the most are, and it's from the Rasmussen polling agency, and they did a good job last time around, better than anybody else, I think. Mm -hmm. And the numbers that get me is that Donald Trump has a 46% approval rating among African Americans. Mm -hmm. And if you just do African American males, he has a sixty percent, some sixty percent number. Sixty-three, yeah. Approval among African Americans, sixty plus percent approval among African American males of the Republican, doesn't mean they're going to vote for him. They haven't mm -hmm. voted yet. But the usual rate is ten percent, twelve percent, and he, and Donald Trump did the best of any Republican since I, I, I think uh, Abraham Lincoln <laughs> among the African-American vote. And now he they has got- vote back then, but it's okay. But now he's got majority <laughs> approval. Yeah. Again, that's approval. It's mm. not voting. Yeah. He also has a majority approval among Hispanic males. So these are the twin pillars of the democratic vote in many parts of the country. Because we don't have an urban educated elite here, like yes, in Gainesville and Miami and some of the big cities. We Miami, have. Jacksonville, yeah. So, but it's not. We're not Connecticut, where it's suburbia, uh, the Gold Coast along the uh, along the Connecticut Turnpike. Well, uh, Connecticut is always solidly Democrat. They they often put in a, a Republican governor. Who, who goes to jail? Who goes to jail? <laughs> who's who's that's a when when you're a Republican governor in Connecticut, that's your next step before federal prison, and so it just they I, and they must do it to embarrass us. They just uh, they finally the, the person who should not be the Republic, Republican governor and oh dear, my wife is drinking my cough. You guys, you haven't seen me drinking out of the mug because I left it inside the RV. Thank you, Jill. Well, Happy birthday, Joe. If I, if I may say that um, we do have uh, Democrats in my congregation because we're all transplants. Sure. We have a number of older people who have been Democrats all their lives. And, you know, they proudly voted for John F. Kennedy and, and uh, Adelaide Stevenson the first time and so on and so forth. And they'll, they'll vote for Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. But what I find fascinating is I don't talk politics in the church, yeah. uh, national party politics. Sure. I talk hell and sin and damnation and, you know, get right with God. I, Spiritual I don't talk politics, about, yes. I don't doubt <laughs> Americans, uh, the, the Affordable Care Act. I don't talk sure. about that stuff. There's, there's plenty to keep me busy. People have such a, I've heard it described as a new silo. They only know what their TV show tells them. Sure. So we have people who've never heard of, that there's a Joe Hunter Biden problem. No. Never heard of it. And these are educated adults. Sure. But because they only watch CNN or MSNBC, they have this worldview. Now then we have people who watch the Hannity show, which I don't want to say, is pretty over the top at times. It's over the top, yeah. And they have this worldview that, you know, I don't, he, you know, whoa, where's this coming from? Um, but so the 
we have we as a nation have been failed by the media who have not presented all sides of the story now again Hannity is an opinion show it's his right to offer an opinion as just as Rachel Maddow was well, opinion. hold on Sean Hannity is also an entertainer yes. he, he's there to draw the biggest audience he can Rachel Maddow also is audience based uh, she knows if she draws in the the f- I'm gonna just I, this, it's not my term the foaming liberals will will watch her and watch her and uh, she'll keep feeding the same story over and over again that break they're doing that for their paycheck um Hannity believes 95 percent of what he says Rachel Maddow believes 95 percent of what she says uh the other five percent is just to get that rating you know just just bring that extra rating in but the the, the 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 newspapers, the press. I mean, we need to divide out the opinion people. That's their job. Sure, we but are it's opinion all, people. It, it's but it's the news media, uh, the, the the reporters, who are hiding stories from the press, so that when we do, let's say we do have a Trump blowout, relatively speaking, not mm-hmm. a McGovern, uh, Nixon level <laughs> blowout, but or a Mondale. Reagan, Reagan that's the that's the standard. <laughs> yeah, not that level, but let's just say we have another solid, unambiguous win the way we did last time. Mm-hmm. There are going to be many people in this country who are, it's like, it has to be fraud because everything I've heard, yeah. everything I've seen, all my friends, the things I read in TV tells me it's not going to happen. And but it happens. You're saying TV. I think the biggest uh, feeder of news for people nowadays are the Facebooks and the Twitters. I never saw this story about Hunter Biden in my Facebook feed. None of my friends posted it. None of my liberal friends ever linked to this or mentioned it. I never saw it in my MS, you know, all that. And there's a documentary on Netflix right now that I want everybody to watch before they vote. It's called The Social Dilemma, Our Social Dilemma. Um, it is a fair documentary about the effects of artificial intelligence and the Facebooks and the just that that hive mindset we have as Democrats and Republicans in this two-party country and how elections are affected and how our opinion is affected by what we see on screen. Um, If you look at my Facebook feed, I probably have 60% Republican, 40% Democrat uh, in France. The posts I see are probably 80% conservative maybe 85% conservative posts because that's what Facebook knows I like. Even though uh, I have many, many Democrat fans who post all the time, it just doesn't, doesn't feed that to me right away because it knows Kevin is a Reagan, Demo- uh, Reagan Republican and doesn't want to see uh, Aunt uh, Louisa's uh, thoughts on uh, pollution. Well, Kevin, 80, 90 percent of the ad- things I see are about why I should start a keto diet. So what is keto? Oh, well, see, I'm just saying, <laughs> Facebook is on to us. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I, the the other day, uh, and this is the going joke in the RV. Uh, I've lost a little weight. We're here in the neck. You could see, okay. So I was saying to Jill, I need a new belt. She goes, all right, we'll go to Walmart and get you a new belt. Not by the end of the evening, we're doing a search on Google, and what pops up? Belt ads. What, I mean, so are, you, what are the chances a belt ad is going to come up the same day we talk about my weight loss? So, you know, the, uh, they say they ain't listening, they're listening. You know, what do they hear? It's got uh, Mr. Coulson has an excessive gas today, you know. <laughs> Which now nah, we won't go into that, but let you guys know if you're thinking about RV, and please know that all smells are enhanced, including the kitty litter in an RV. There, that's my that's my PSA for you guys out there. George, any other news? We've gone long today, but I thought we could uh, we could get it in. Uh, you have to run into the next room for a church meeting at 11. That's three minutes away. Uh, let, let's close out the program. Again, guys, please uh, help us on social media. If you see us on YouTube or Facebook, like the program. Send this to your friends as a URL so they can see the program. Uh, In a a few short days, there's going to be an election. And this is a great time not to have angst, not to be anxious, but to pray for our country. You know, God has us here for a reason. And it's, uh, 
a unique situation that we live in a country that allows for democracy and we, we shall see what happens I always and I, I hear I'm a hypocrite get anxious in November every four years George it's it's my nature that's because I love my country I'm Kevin Coulson and I'm George Conger and you've been watching episode 627 of Anglican Unscripted